Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Are You Ready for Employee Benefit Plan audit conference call. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you have a question, you can submit at any time through the webcast console. If at any time during the conference you need to reach an operator, please press the star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Wednesday, September 12, 2018. I would now like to turn the conference over to Bumari Colon, CPA Manager. Please go ahead, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. I am Vilmari Colon, Audit Manager, as she just mentioned, and I will be speaking to you in this afternoon along Sylvia Bonnet, also Audit Manager here at Kevin Grant Thornton. We will be speaking to you several topics about how to be prepared for your retirement plan audit. Also, during the course of the presentation, we will be making certain polling questions about several facts. We invite you to participate by answering such questions. In today's webcast, we will be first discussing several key players in a retirement plan audit. Also, we will make a refreshment of key documents that management should have in the, should have in the records for a retirement plan. Also, we will review ERISA audit requirements, explaining the difference between a full scope or limited scope audit. When we use the work of an expert, we will also review ERISA bonding requirements, new developments new developments related to retirement plans for this year, and common deficiencies that have been identified in internal controls and financial statements during our audits and also based on experience of AICPA other colleagues. First, we have here a chart of the key players in a retirement plan. For first and most important is the employer or the plan sponsor, which is any person acting as an employer or indirectly in the interest of an employer in relation to an employee benefit plan. Also, it includes a group or association of employers acting for an employer in such capacity. When a plan includes several sponsors, but are, these are related companies, this is still considered a single employer plan. Also, they, there may be plans composed of credit unions, associations, etc. In this case, this may be considered multi-employer plans. When a company or an employer decides to establish a retirement plan, it will use the services of an attorney or a legal assistant to assist in the design of the plan, of the plan including a structure, the definition of terms, etc. Within the employer, in the right side of the slide, you have the finance and human resources departments, which both should work together for the proper administration of the plan. Based on our experience, sometimes we have noted that the task of working with the plan is delegated to only one person or one department, and all of the departments need to work together. Delegating such tasks to only one person may become a risk for the company and expose the plan also to several other risks of fraud between other matters. Everybody should also know who performs the specific roles in the plan. For example, who is the record keeper? Who is the custodian of the investments? Who is the trustee? This will ensure proper communication of plan issues and a proper administration. The record keeper, custodian, and investment advisors, which are the parties presented on the left side of the slide, are usually third parties are related to the plan sponsor, and in some cases, also the trustee. It is important to mention that even though a plan sponsor may hire the services of third parties, the fiduciary responsibilities will always rely on the plan sponsor or employer. The trustee should be the party named in a trust agreement or in the trust provision of the plan document that is authorized to hold the assets of the plan for the benefit of the participants. The trustee may function merely in the capacity of a custodian of the assets or may be given authority over the investment of the assets. The record keeper would be the party that accounts for the buying and selling of the investments, the contributions to the plan, and the distributions to terminated employees. In summary, they are the bookkeepers of the plan's transactions. They also provide enrollment materials, information required to be disclosed to participants, online access to account information, and retirement plan tutorials. 
is it's very important that even though a plan sponsor hires these parties, as mentioned previously, the fiduciary and overall responsibility always remains with the plan sponsor. And none of these parties, not, not the record keeper, not the third party trustee, can initiate any transaction without the proper approval from the employer or plan sponsor designated personnel. We emphasize again that all these parties should work together in order to comply with the DOL filing requirements and avoid the imposition of penalties. As you see at the end of this of the slide, we have the DOL, which is not the least important, but the party which we, which with me must comply, which is the regulator of the retirement plans. Here we have our first polling question, and we are asking, is your plan currently audited? We appreciate if you can answer very quickly this question so we can have an idea of our listeners today. Okay, we see that 77.8% of our listeners today are being currently audited, and 22.2% is not currently being audited. So for uh, those are, who are currently being audited, this may be a refresher, so you may be about one a month and three days of your deadline of filing your Form 5500 and completing your audit. And those who are not currently audited may be in the process of coordinating the same or may be required to do so in the near future. Key documents that we, we should have or the plan sponsor should have in their records, first and most important is the plan document, which should be, speci which should specify all the provisions of the plan. For example, who is eligible, contributions calculation, vesting requirements, use of for features, etc. All the terms of the plan have to be documented in this plan document. Then we have the summary plan description, which should be provided to all employees when hired or when they are eligible to enter the plan. It is important to know that if the plan document is amended throughout any years, it is very important and recommended that the summary plan description also be amended so the employees or the participants of the plan have the latest information of such benefit. Also, we have the trust agreements in the case that the company decides to hire a third-party service provider as a trustee. The investment advisor agreement, which is also very important if internally the company does not have the personnel or the resources required with the knowledge of the investments. The third-party administrator contract in case the plan sponsor uses a third party to administrate the general responsibilities of the plan. The trustees report in the case of a defined contribution plan, which should be reviewed and reconciled with internal records once received in order to ascertain that all transactions have been properly recorded. Usually these reports are received monthly or quarterly and should not be open just when the financial statement audit will be performed. As mentioned previously, they should be reconciled monthly. The actuary reports in the case of defined benefit plans, which is the report in which the actuary reports the assumptions used and the funding status of the plan. The plan's financial statements, which should be prepared by management or use the assistance of the auditors if considered necessary. The insurance contracts related to the fidelity bond should be safeguarded and employers should ascertain the policy issuer is included within a list of providers approved by the Federal Treasury Department. This policy should also specify the plans that are covered by the same. Sylvia will be speaking more about this later in the presentation. Then we have the Form 5500 which is the annual form filed with the DOL or Department of Labor. This form is due seven months after the end of the plan year. There is an additional extension of two and a half months, but it is not automatic. The form 5558 should be completed and filed in order to request the extension. So this means that for calendar years, 
the return would be initially due in July 31st and with the extension in October 15. Also, we have the SOC 1 reports, which includes an opinion over the design effectiveness of the controls implemented by a service provider. There should be written evidence that the plan administrator or board of trustees perform their due diligence by reviewing annually the SOC 1 reports of the plan service providers and that any deficiency identified by the service providers' auditors should be evaluated if they affect or do not affect the plan. Also, management must ascertain that the plan sponsor has in place the, in place the required user controls identified in the SOC 1 report. If you verify these reports in the index of them, you will see that there is always a, uh, a section called user controls. So the plan sponsor, if the plan sponsor does not comply with such controls, the controls that the service provided may not work as intended, and therefore they may be errors in your financial records. As highlighted in this slide, it's very important that the DOL wants to see those documents that management has to have them, have them safeguarded, and if you don't have them, you could be assessed as a prohibited transaction. Also, that you, will, you will note that the auditors should request these documents annually. You cannot assume that the same have remained the same. Usually there are amendments that are required, and therefore the auditors will request for them every year to see if there have been any changes. So what are the requirements for a pension plan to be audited? Well, ARISA requires that plans with 100 or more participants as of the beginning of the plan year be audited. So that means that audited financial statements should accompany the Form 5500, and that is what is considered a large plan. It is very important to mention and clarify that a participant for these purposes is also one that is eligible but has not elected to participate in the plan. Also includes those that have been terminated but still have funds in the plan. So every year at the beginning of the year, the plan sponsor needs to make the assessment to, to see which one are participants under this definition. Also, plans with less than 100 participants at the beginning of the plan year, which are considered small plans but do not meet certain waiver conditions will be required to have an audit, but this situation is not frequent. ERISA provides an, extension, an exception, which is the 8120 exemption. What this means is that plans that have between 80 through 120 participants at the beginning of the plan year may complete the Form 5500 in the same category as it was filed for the previous year as a small or a large plan. So under this rule, once the plan reaches 120 participants, it needs to be audited. However, if a plan begins with 100 participants, this exception does not apply and needs to be audited. A plan may also defer the audit requirement for the first of two plan years is the, if the first year is a short period, which is a period of seven months or less. Here we emphasize that ERISA says that the requirement may be deferred, therefore not eliminated. This will result in reduced audit fees, taken in consideration if internal controls and processes are the same for both years, also if there have been no changes in record keeper or trustee. Now we have the polling question number two. Has the DOL performed a desk audit of your retirement plan? So based on the answers that we have received, 81.8 has not had, had a desk audit of their retirement plan, but 18.2% have had those type of audits. We would like to mention that these audits are more frequent than you would like to think, and they are sporadically, so we don't know when the audit performed to your retirement plan will be selected for examination, but they are very emphatic in the requirements that they have, 
and you may be imposed additional penalties if you don't comply with any of the requirements. So that is the importance of selecting a good auditor for your financial statement audit. Now let's continue talking about the types of audits that you have in a retirement plan audit. Basically, there are two types. You have the full scope or the limited scope audit. So in a full scope audit, we audit the investments. And in a limited scope audit, we don't audit the investments. That is the major difference. So you may be thinking, what audit should I select? Well, that decision of the audit to be performed is made by the plan administrator or board of trustees or the designated party within the company. The difference, obviously, is since we do not audit the investments, it results in lower audit fees. In this case, the auditor issues a disclaimer of opinion and not an unmodified or modified opinion as it would be in a full scope audit. As for the DOL regulations, when there is an audit required, the financial statements accompanying the annual form 5500 must be in accordance with GAAP. So therefore, the financial statements of a limited scope audit have the same presentation as if a full scope audit had been performed. There is only a change in the opinion, as I mentioned previously, it would be a disclaimer, and a note disclosing the information that was certified by the custodian or the trustee. The, deal, the limited scope exclusion provides that you do not have to audit the investments, as I mentioned, related to the valuation and existence, the plan level investment activity, which would be the purchases and sales of investments, only if a qualifying institution holding the assets certifies the, to the accuracy and completeness of the information. So these two words are very important. The certification needs to be both accurate and complete. It cannot be only one of the requirements. So which parties would be considered qualifying institutions? First, a bank, a trust company, or a similar institution, an insurance carrier. It has to be regulated and supervised and subject to periodic examination by a state or federal agency. Also, an agent can certify on behalf of a qualified institution, and in these cases, the plan sponsor needs to have an agency agreement which should be provided also to the auditor, and the certification would have some, a certain modification in its language. It should say, for example, ABC as agent of XYZ Trust Company. Important to note here, as the last bullet in this slide, is that broker, dealers, and investment companies are not certified. There is sometimes some confusion here because there are several investment companies that have also um, subsidiaries or related companies that are trustees, and they are the ones that provide the certification. A more common confusion is, for example, Fidelity. They are a service provider, they are an investment company, but they have an affiliate that provides trustee services. So in this case, that would be the party providing the certification. Key considerations for this, this certification are the following. Is this party qualified to certify the included investments based on the previous qualifications? Who is signing this certification? Is this person authorized? Is there any qualifying language in the certification? Does this institution actually hold the investments and execute investment transactions? This is why we mentioned previously in the key player's description that everybody within the plan needs to properly understand the role of each party. And that's, why, that's where you identify who actually holds the investments and executes such transactions. Also, are all investments certified? For ERISA purposes, the loans from participants are investments. Therefore, we must ascertain that such certification does not exclude the loans or any other type of investments. If there are exclusions, then additional work may have to be performed. Also, is the certification at year end important that the certification provided to the auditor coincides with the year end of the plan? Also, another key consideration is if there was a change in trustee or custodian during the year. 
when there is a change in record keeper, trustee, custodian, more than one certification may be required, so it is important to identify this early in the audit process. And also, it is very important to determine if the certification covers the fair value or the contract value of the underlying investments. Depending on the type of investments that the plan has, there may be certain um, investments that are valued at contract value. So that is important to identify. As stated in the audit guide related to pension plans, it stated that even though us as auditors are not required to audit certain investment information when the limited scope audit exception is applicable, if the auditor becomes aware that the certified information is incorrect, incomplete, or otherwise unsatisfactory, further inquiry may be necessary, which may result in additional testing or modification to the auditor's report. They may, this may also cause that instead of a limited scope audit, we may be required to perform a full scope audit. This is also why a plan sponsor should always make sure to use reputable companies to provide the required services. The plan administrator, the plan committee, or the board of trustees have a fiduciary responsibility to select competent service providers to protect the trust assets. Also, the auditor has no responsibility to test the accuracy or completeness of investment information, as stated previously, in a limited scope audit when it is certified by the plan's trustee or custodian. Therefore, we do not have the responsibility to obtain an understanding of internal control maintained by the certifying institution over investments held and investment transactions executed for the plan or Nevertheless, we do not have to assess the control risk associated with assets held and transactions executed by the institution. So, therefore, we as auditors do not need to obtain or review the stock one report for the plan's certifying trustee or custodian related to the certified investments. As auditors, we should only be provided with the record keeper, payroll, for example, stock one reports, in this case, payroll is very important because many companies here in Puerto Rico use third-party service providers for processing payroll, such as ADP. These parties usually have a high involvement in the process of withholding contributions, depositing those contributions to the trustee. Therefore, the stock one report has to be obtained by management and provided to the auditor. What are our responsibilities related to the, to the investments for a limited scope audit? Our responsibility will be limited to comparing the certified information to the form and content of the financial statements, the disclosures, and the Schedule H of the Form 5500. Also, we should determine that the financial statements and disclosures are in compliance both with GAAP and the DOL requirements and ensuring, based on the type of plan, that the disclosures are appropriate. Okay, so which are our responsibilities in a full-scope audit? We need to obtain an analysis of changes and invest investments during the period. This analysis should be prepared by management, and, may and they should maintain it updated in order to avoid any errors in the investments presented for audit purposes. Also, we obtain evidence regarding the existence and ownership of investments. We do this through confirmation procedures. We review minutes and agreements. Also, it is very important to know that minutes should be prepared in order to document properly the approval of investment selections and other important transactions affecting the operations of the plan. We also test the investment transactions through authorization reviews, broker's advice, etc. We verify the reasonability of investment income, such as interest and dividends. We also review if there is any interest income or investment income that should be recorded as a receivable as of year end, and the fair value of investments. Remember that we mentioned previously that in a limited scope audit, we do not verify these transactions, but in a full scope audit, they need to be verified. 
And with respect to the fair value, we may be required to use an expert depending on the type of investments that the plan has. We also test the computation of the net change in appreciation or depreciation of the fair value of investments, other known, otherwise known as the unrealized income. We also perform inquiry procedures regarding compliance with the plan's investment policy. It is important here related to the investment policy that management needs to understand the type of investments that they have selected for the plan. They should be able to explain how those investments are valued, what is the strategy, among other factors. Also, during our subsequent events review, we verify if there has been a significant decline in fair value of the investments. And as with a limited scope audit, we also perform a review of the financial statements disclosure to verify that they are in compliance with GAAP and DOL. As I have mentioned earlier in some of the slides, there are instances where we will be required to use the work of an expert. Basically, this is related to fair value, which is the most significant estimate in pension plans financial statements. Auditors often need to involve specialists when auditing management process for developing fair value measurement. As the need for fair value determinations has expanded, the use and need for external pricing specialists available to auditors has also increased. This to properly audit the value of investments that are more complex. An example of this are the bonds, which usually do not have a readily determinable value. The experts to be used, it is important that they are discussed between the plan representative and the auditor since the engagement letter process. For defined benefit plans, the auditor also must determine whether methods and assumptions used by the actuary are reasonable. So to do this, we confirm with the actuary affiliations and qualifications. We also verify that the actuary is independent and also, it is important to verify the need to use the assistance of a third party for review the assumptions used by the actuary. So most of the firms do not have internal specialists related to actuarial assumptions. So in our case, we use the services of an actuarial specialist of the Compensation Department of Grant Thornton. And this is very important that we emphasize this because this is one of the most um, deficiencies that are identified by the DOL when they perform the DOL desk audits. It is very important that the review and the conclusion about the reasonableness of the assumptions used by the actuary are properly documented in the auditor's working papers and also that they are understood by management. So we have here another polling question. Which of the following deficiencies have been identified during the audit of your plan? So A, timely deposits, which is one of the most common, errors in participants' data, lack of reconciliation of funds, or incorrect benefits payments. So the answer actually does um, concur with what we expected, that the most common deficiency is related to timely deposits. Then um, errors in participant data and lack of affiliation of funds are both tied with 12.5%. And the deficiency of timely deposits, we have 88.9% of deficiencies identified in this section. So we will be discussing these types of deficiencies later in the presentation. Now I will leave you with Sylvia who will be speaking about the ERISA bonding requirements and other topics. Thanks, Vilmari. Beginning with ERISA bond requirements, it is very important that all plan sponsors obtain a fiduciary bond for all administrators, officers, and employees who handle funds or other property of the plan. The fidelity bond is a type of insurance that protects the plan against losses caused by acts of fraud or dishonesty. This bond should be in the amount of 10% of the plan assets, up to a maximum of $500,000. It's important that the assets to determine bonding should be measured at the beginning of year. So for example, 
If the net assets at the beginning of year are $2 million, your policy will be of $200,000. Also, it is important that the plan is covered and properly bonded the whole year. For example, let's say your plan's fiscal year is December 31st, and your policy is as of October 31st. The plan needs to renew such policies since November in order to cover the last two months of the year. Another important fact is that the bond must be placed with an insurance agency included in the U.S. Treasury listing approved, as indicated by BIMARI. You can find this list in the webpage of the Federal Treasury Department. In addition to the consequence of not being properly covered for any loss, noncompliance with bonding requirement is reported in the 5500. In terms of the latest developments applicable to pension plan, we have that during 2017, as a result of Hurricane Maria, the Puerto Rico Treasury Department issued the Administrative Determination 1729. Such administrative determinations allows hardship with travel due to hurricane losses. However, the plan document should be amended to include this as an acceptable reason for hardship. Participants should request funds with an affidavit. The benefit to the participant are that the first $10,000 are exempt of taxes and any excess up to $100,000 will tax at a rate of 10%. The final due date for participants to request funds was June 30, 2018. However, by administrative determination 1813, the due date was extended until November 30, 2018. The Administrative Determination 1729 also stated that there is no need to obtain a new qualification letter from the Puerto Rico Treasury Department due to the amendment of the plan document regarding this. As part of this webcast, we want to briefly discuss the most common internal control and financial statement deficiencies in order to help you identify similar situations and implement corresponding corrective actions. First, let's take a look to the most common internal control deficiencies identified in a pension plan audit. Errors in participant data used by the actuary. These can be errors in the date of hire, date of birth, name, and other information. Error in this information can cause miscalculation in the actuarial computation, which can result in additional fees to correct any errors. Another deficiency is incorrect benefit payments. These can also be caused by errors in participant data, as mentioned above. When processing benefit payments, the plan administrator should ensure that all important information is included in the distribution form and that the same is accurate as well as in the record keeper records. Another example are payments made to deceased participants instead of their beneficiaries. It is very important for the plan sponsor to create controls to monitor and update participant information in order to capture this type of error before an audit. Um, as, we, uh, as we saw on our polling question, one of the most common deficiencies is the untimely deposit of participant contribution. Remember that the DOL state that deposits should be made as soon as administratively feasible, making deposits no later than the 15 business day of the month following the withholding is not a safe harbor anymore. The untimely deposit of participant contributions are considered a prohibited transaction. A prohibited transaction occurs when a fiduciary causes the plan to enter into a transaction which benefits any trustee or person in or entity connected to the plan. Also, they are considered transactions between the plan and party in interest that are prohibited under Section 406A of ERISA. 
When we identify a prohibited transaction, we should also consider the impact of the financial statements in terms of disclosure and supplemental schedules. Prohibited transactions are also disclosed on Schedule G of the, supplement of the 5500, regardless of its financial materiality. This means that although the effect is a minimal amount, it should be disclosed in the 5500. The Employee Benefit Security Administration has the authority to investigate and, if necessary, take enforcement action to remedy violations of ERISA. However, the Employee Benefit Security Administration has dis designated the Voluntary Fiduciary Correction Program to assist plan sponsor and others in voluntarily correcting certain ERISA violations, including delinquent participant contributions and participant loan repayments. Under this program, eligible plan officials can submit an application to the Employee Benefit Security Administration, demonstrating self-correction of violation, including the restoration of any lost earnings to the plan and their participants. You can access this tool in the DOL website in the Voluntary Fiduciary Correction Program section. Another um, common deficiency and this one can have significant monetary consequence, is using an incorrect definition of compensation. For example, suppose that the definition of eligible compensation on the plan document is gross salary, but due to an error in system, the corresponding employee deferrals and matching contributions um, excludes bonus and car allowance. In this case, the plan sponsor to correct this failure should deposit the missing matching contribution and the 50% of the missing employee deferrals plus corresponding loss earning. Another deficiency is the inaccurate contribution percentages. For example, the participant deferral percentage was 2%, but to, due to an error in system, a withholding of 20% was made. It is very important that, as mentioned before, the plan, the plan sponsor make spot checks and validate this information with original documents included in the employee file. Another example of deficiencies are lack of reconciliation of funds transferred to the trust and sponsor records. The proper reconciliation of this information can help to detect on a timely basis any payroll not transferred to the plan. This will avoid late contribution to the plan and lost earning payments. Additional um, internal control deficiencies are the lack of spousal consent for payment of benefits and lack of approval for payment of benefits. Remember that benefit payments need the spouse consent and should be approved by the plan administrator. Continuing with um, internal control deficiencies, we have um, the lack of adequate support in employees' files. It is very important to maintain employee files with the latest salary information. Files also should include the latest deferral percentage selection, evidence of participant data, enrollment forms, among others. Plan not properly bonded. As mentioned and explained before, the plan should be properly bonded during the year. Another um, deficiency is the lack of minutes of trustee meetings. It is important that the Board of Trustees or the plan committee meet to evaluate the plan performing, consideration of new laws, determinations, and other important matters. It is very important that those meetings are documented in minutes. This is part of the evidence that the plan sponsor is complying with fiduciary responsibilities of monitoring the plan. Another common deficiency is the lack of review of SOC 1 report. As previously explained by Bill Mari, the service organization control report should be obtained and reviewed by the plan sponsor. Although you may think this is not an important deficiency, it can have significant consequences. In this report are established the user entity controls which are the process and controls that the plan sponsor should have 
to ensure that the controls of the service organization operate effectively. Management should understand and have these controls in place. This report is also useful for management to identify any deficiency at the service organization that might be of concern and further evaluation and consideration. Last, we have the lack of documentation supporting that an employee elected not to participate in the plan. It's important to have evidence that the eligible participants elected not to enter to the plan. Financial statements deficiencies. In terms of financial statement deficiencies, the most common are omissions or errors in the fair value disclosures required by accounting standards 820, fair value measurements. The financial statements should, specific, should include specific disclosure of the valuation methodology of investments. Also, it should include the fair value hierarchy of the plan investments in level one, two, or three. Level one is the, pricing, is the pricing that have quoted prices in active market. Level two use inputs older than quoted prices included within level one that are observable. Level three is the use of unobservable inputs during the pricing. In a full scope audit, remember that we use an expert for valuation purposes. And in a limited scope audit, the evaluation must be confirmed with trustee, client, or custodian. Failure to include the reconciliation between the amount in the form 5500 and the financial statements. This reconciliation should be included when there are differences between the net assets presented in the 5500 and the financial statements. Examples can be loans on default, excess contribution payable recorded in the financial statements and not reflected in the 5500. Another financial statement deficiency is the omission of risk and uncertainties, subsequent event, tax status, and party in interest disclosures. We should always take in consideration that although this is a specialized industry which will require certain specific disclosure, pension plan financial statements also require general disclosures such as these ones. Another um, deficiency is the failure to make disclosure about the amount and disposition of forfeited amount. Financial statements should include a note indicating the balance of forfeitures at the end of year and the amount used of forfeitures in accordance with plan documents. Forfeitures are the non-vested portion of the participant accounts remain as plan assets that may only be used or allocated in accordance with the plan document. Another deficiency is the failure to comply with U.S. Department of Labor requirement to present a comparative statement of net assets available for benefits. However, the statement of changes in net assets available for benefit is presented in single year. Um, continuing with financial statements deficiency, we have the failure to attach the schedule of assets held at the end of the year to the financial statements. This schedule is presented for the year under audit only. Remember that we should include loans receivable, if any, and in this schedule disclose the range of interest rates and maturity dates and how many loans are outstanding at the end of year. Also, we should identify parties in interest within this schedule. Disclosure regarding certified information that do not include all information certified or that include amounts or transactions that were not certified as complete and accurate. As discussed by Bill Mari, we should read carefully the certification obtained by the trust or custodian. The financial statement disclosure should include the information in the certification related to investments and notes receivable, including corresponding interest and dividend income. 
failure to present investment income exclusive of changes in fair value. The interest and dividend income should be presented separately from the net appreciation and depreciation of investment. Continuing with financial statement deficiencies, we have um, the failure to present additional supplemental schedules, failure to disclose administrative expense paid by the plan sponsor, and the failure to disclose benefit payments requested before the year end but disbursed subsequently. An important note here is that no adjustment is needed on the financial statements regarding this. Remember that financial statements are management responsibility. As you have seen through the presentation, this type of audit have a lot of requirements and are very specialized. Therefore, the plan sponsor should ensure to hire a competent audit firm. The firm should have experience in auditing pension plans and train their personnel regarding this type of audits. Auditors with supervisory roles and the in-charge auditor should have eight hours of CPE credits within a three years period. For example, here in Kevin Grant Thornton, we make sure that all employees comply with the CPE credits annually. It is recommended that the firm performing the audit be a member of the Employee Audit Quality Center of the AICPA. A very important fact is that the plan sponsor, sponsor should ensure that the auditors obtain the sufficient understanding of the plan and how it operates. Remember that specialization delivers quality. To finalize the presentation, we are including links with very useful information, including a section of frequently asked um, questions. Here we are including the links for, your, for, for future references. Um, here we have um, the next polling question, and it says, do you still have doubt on how to prepare your retirement plan audit? No, um, the 80% of, of, of the persons taking the training says no, and yes, 20%. So we think we did a pretty good job making the, the training. But any further doubt that you might have, you can um, write us an email and, and, and let you know um, the answers. Another polling question, would you like to be contacted by us? Well, in the case of persons that um, um, answer yes, we, it will be a pleasure for us to contact you um, regarding any further help or references that you might need. understand your plan requirements and the audit that you may need. We also have here a question from one of the participants that uh, she is asking what is a death audit? So um, I don't know if you guys heard me about a question that we have from a participant because I have someone commenting that she had no audio. I will repeat it just in case you couldn't hear me. We had a question from a participant that was asking what is a desk audit. So the DOL does not perform actual audits on site. In the case the DOL selects a plan for an audit, the auditor, for example us, with authorization from the client, sends the audit file to the DOL for review or examination. And then they send us uh, questions or send them directly to the plan sponsor in order to in, uh, conclude if it was a quality audit that complies with their requirements. So that is a desk audit. 
So if there are no further questions, it has been a pleasure for us to be with you today, today in this afternoon. And we are here available for any other questions that you may have. So yeah, for any further information, you can visit also our website and also contact us through there. So it has been a pleasure again, and thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.